Or I guess. Um, <clears throat> for you, those of you that don't know me, I'm Dean Crawl, and I'm the <clears throat> project coordinator for a demonstration project for Central Platte Natural Resources District. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is cover crops. And what what I'd like to do here is I'm going to give you an idea. I want to give you an idea of how we started and why we started using cover crops. As you all know, and I know the Upper Big Blue also has some, some nitrate issues in their groundwater. So what we, what we were seeing here in Central Platte was there were, we've been working at this for many, many years of getting the nitrate values down in our groundwater and looking at where we were seeing areas uh, within the district that we had, didn't get the negative response, in other words, the lowering of the nitrates, we started looking at cropping practices and things like that. And what we noticed was a large part of that was in, in the seed corn uh, production areas. So over time, I had worked with, with one of the seed companies to try and um, work on the nitrogen applications of to the seed corn, but, but we, there was no consistency. In other words, uh, a lot of times a recommended rate would have been like 44 to 75 pounds per acre, which basically uh, hindered the yield of that seed corn. So I got, to, I got to thinking about this and I thought, well, you know, instead of messing around, uh, making recommendations on the, on the uh, seed corn, how much nitrogen to put on, why don't we manage what residual is left? And that's where we started utilizing cover crops. So back in 2010, I started looking at what happens to the residual nitrogen in the soil. And this graph that you're seeing here is a, a, a series of sampling that I did in a seed corn field where we set it up where there was no, no cover crop planted, turnips only, turnips, radishes, rapeseed, uh, spring barley, oats, and the other one is like, you know, same thing, except I, I substituted rye instead of oats. And what you're seeing here is the red line there where there was nothing, we noticed that the residual kept climbing all the way through the off season. In other words, from September all the way through up through April. But any other ones that we had cover crops planted in, we had a uptake of the nitrogen in the soil for that, for the, for that residual end. Now, I presented, I, I talked about this at a meeting at the time and, and one of the producers in the audience says, well, what happens to, what happens to the nitrogen then? You uptake it. Well, as you can see, it released it back for that next coming, that next coming crop. Now, why is this important? It's important because we minimize the residual in, in the off season that would, be, would have been subject to leaching, excess rain, excess snow, so on and so forth. So, so that cover crop brought that down. All right, in 2010, I thought, okay, this is, this is real promising. This looks good. This is what we wanted to do. What about 2011? Basically the same thing, more sporadic uh, results that year than it was the year before, but still, if you, if you look at this, generally the cover crops uptake that nitrogen, held it up and then released it back that next spring. So as we get into, the, as we get into this, and I don't know how many people in the audience here have used cover crops, but there, was, there has always been a question about delayed planting, and which which I what I mean by that is 
the longer you wait to plan it, the less results that you'll get or the less benefit that you will get out of introducing the cover crop. So I found a cooperator out in Dawson County where we, we took uh, his drill. And as you can see there on the left, we, we put little cups over, the, over each one of the outlets of the, the drill so we could plant different species or different mixes and then we could look at those uh, for, for a, actually for a field day is what this was for. This is some pictures that, that I took um, August 4th. And the, the, the pictures on the left were planted July 6th and the ones on the right was two weeks later. Look at the, look at the difference there in what two weeks made as far as growth of that cover crop. Uh, you, you see on the left, on the right here, there was more weeds that, that come up. So the cover crop, you know, suppressed the weeds and things like that. So a two week period here made a huge difference. Now, another thing that everybody always wants to know What's the benefit to the soil? What happened? What happens below ground? So what I so what I did here, I had I had th these six mixes over here, which you can read here. I went in and on July sixth and measured the plant height and the root depth of each one of these mixes. Now. What's really important here is look at, and what I'd like to point out here is, look at the root depth of those mixes. We've got, we've got roots all the way down to 43 inches on mix five, 38 on mix, on mix three. I mean, the least, the least root depth that we had was mix four where we just had rapeseed and oats. Uh, to 19 inches. So how does that and what does that do? That, that helps break up compaction, that helps with, with uh, mellowing out that soil for, for future use and things like that. So, so the point here is a lot of times what we're seeing is, yeah, we, we see what's going on out in those fields uh, above ground, but Really, the real story, the real worth here is what's going on below ground. So my point here is, is what you see, or is that all you get? What's the hidden value? And it's in, it's in what's going on below that surface. In 2016, I, I went into one of my producers, the cooperators fields where he had rye that he had planted the, the previous fall had three inch rye above ground. And as you can see by the pictures here, we found, we found roots 30 inches deep when the, when the rye was only three inches tall. We had it, I had a, a PhD or from Lincoln out here that day with me and she could not believe that that, that was even possible, but we, we proved it to her that, that it does do that. Okay, so a lot of the criticism or negative thinking of uh, producers that have not, basically have not, not got into cover crops are, you know, I don't have time. I don't have time to do this uh, so on and so forth. So, so what I've been looking at over time are different planting strategies. First one here is what we call dormant seeding. The, these pictures that were taken on April 12th were planted or sowed the previous in the, in November 15th of the previous year. Basically, basically we, we planted that, really didn't expect anything to happen in the fall, but look at, but look at our cover in the middle of April. 
pretty successful. This is one, this is one strategy that a, a producer could use. Uh, if time, and I understand time commitment during, during or right, you know, during harvest and stuff is pretty, pretty slim, but this would give, this is an opportunity here that a person could do that maybe possibly after, after harvest is over. And we tried, we tried different, different, uh, uh, basically grasses here uh, to, to demonstrate this. Okay, frost seeding. I read about this in a newsletter from Oregon. Um, they were talking about frost seeding. The company that, that I read, the newsletter article that I read actually was the, was the, the producer or the person, the people that developed frost, frosty clover. So I thought, I wonder, I wonder if this would happen, if we could make the, accomplish this in Nebraska. So in March of 2019, we went out and we spread frosty clover and oats on top of the snow picture there is what what we use uh, it's a tiny in a row cedar but we just held it out out of the ground and and spread our product across the snow and just to see what would happen so what did happen here's pictures in June what what we noticed is I mean I, this is this is really pretty dang successful and at a time where no other, no other, anything else as far as field work and things like that. That's that's uh, not even a competition for for doing this. But what we tried, what we did here is we had enough oats, so we tried different amounts of oats that we planted per acre. And if you, if you look at if you look at these pictures on a cover crop situation, forty pounds would be plenty. Yes, they're more, it's more dense in the 70 and 120, but this, this procedure uh, was successful. So there's, there's another situation or time period that a person could go ahead and plant that cover crop for that next growing season. And I know last, last year, in the in the east where it was so wet and stuff like that where producers back there majority of the time do plant like rye and things like that they couldn't get into the field so i had i had a number of calls from from producers from back east on what what i what my suggestion was uh for them to do and, th and this was this was early spring and I, I suggested oats. And the only reason why I did that is because you're gonna get a lot faster biomass growth above ground with oats than you would with rye. Now, how many did that that I, that I talked to? I don't know that at this point, but I think this is, this is one product I think that we may, may wanna look at a little more in, in this area, in central Nebraska. Uh, and utilize that that cover crop, so it looks you know if your biomass is important here, it's a it's a, another option. So let's talk about interseeding, and I know that's what Dan Dan was talking about or wanted me to talk about. Um, I've been at this since 2014, and the rig the rig up there in the, the top right corner is what at that time, what we use to, to do our interseeding. Um, the interseeding at that time was not where, as far as crop maturity was a lot later than what, what we do now. Um, but over time we found out that, that um, the earlier you can get it in, the better off you are. So, in 2014, here's some here's some pictures of that. Uh, we used that that high boy with that herd herd spreader on it. The only disadvantage or the negative about this, 
the was calibration. Uh, we ended up putting on probably close to 70 pounds when we all was all said and done uh, in that commercial corn, which is way too much, costs way too much, you know, per acre. But but we did, I mean, we had a good, we had a good stand in 2014. So with, with that in mind, in 2016, we, I was working with this, this producer over by Chapman and he had a lot of uh, spare parts in his surplus machinery pile. So we, we thought, well, what if we could you go ahead and utilize a insecticide box off the of John Deere planter and drop that, drop that down in between the row, use a Heinecker rolling shield to, to incorporate that when we do side dress, which would be somewhere around B, B6, you know, B4 to B6 in maturity range. Well, that was, that was really okay. We had parts, we didn't have a lot of money, money in it, but the problem was we spent, we spent three days in the, in the shop calibrating each one of these boxes with, you know, with, with the, the mix that we had, what, that we wanted to plant. Thought we had it everything really, really good. Well, when we got out to the field, the calibration just went out the window. The it, it didn't it didn't pan out in action out in the field like like it did in the shop where we were calibrating it uh, to to go out to the to the farm. So because of that, uh, I'd say I'd say we we got. We had pretty decent stands that year. If you look at some of the pictures here, of some of the some of the stands that we got in 2016. I mean, it's it's pretty impressive. I mean, but the but the whole thing is, I think whenever whenever we look at either incorporating cover crops into the the system, or even if we have, we still want to be as pretty much accurate. As far as the amount of uh, product we put out there, uh, mainly for for economics. So in 2017, this family purchased a Heinecker in a row seeder. Um, as you can see, basically two ro two rows of of cover crop in between. This is 30 inch rows. Two rows in between each one of those. Uh, the metering, the metering system on a Heinecker is absolutely outstanding. We'll we'll calibrate this in in shop. We, we actually we have a little hand, a little box that we can crank by hand, and we, and we can calibrate the numbers and things like that. So we can set that when we go out and and do the in field stuff. So. I'm not, I don't sound, I don't want to be sound like a Heinecker salesman, but my experiences with this Heinecker unit has been nothing but positive. Here's some shots of, of what, what that looks like uh, after it's planted. You can see two, two rows, two rows of, of cover in between, in between the, the, uh, the corn rows. Now, what have we found out? What have I found out about in a row seeding? Well, first of all, we want to get it in there somewhere around B4, which is not very tall corn. Uh, basically, to utilize the sunlight and stuff like that to get that to get that that crop established, that, that cover crops established. So timing is very important. There's been year, there's been years that Mother Nature has kept us out, maybe to V7, V8. But we went ahead and did, I went ahead and did it anyway. I had the seed, we planted it, just to prove to ourselves and other people that the importance of timing as far as the maturity of that corn crop.
you hear me now, Crystal? Okay. So, so basically, what what we what we did this year, uh, those cameras that that were in that video, uh, as as the as the corn canopy got larger, we were having issues with with connections and stuff like that. So, so what we did, we went out biweekly or weekly and took pictures of each one of the plots that that I had in this in this demonstration. Now to set to set this up, there there are eight different mixes in this plot, uh, and what I what I've done here on each one of these slides is is giving you giving you the mix and the poundage of each each entry in those uh, in that plot, and then the, also the cost per acre. So I'm going to go through these first, and then I'll then I'll make some general statements after after I get done going through them. But as you can see, these are these are actually number one is pretty impressive. We we've got uh, really good emergence, and actually uh, survive it, it it really survived throughout throughout the season. So. As I as I go through these, I'll I'll go kind of slow. I'm not going to read each each entry, but uh, maybe make some comments about each one as I go. Fall graze two. Um, what we did is we got about three three of these that we were kind of targeting maybe the the livestock producers uh, that that would like to have you know cover crops left over after harvest for, for grazing purposes when they're car, when the cows are out there on the stalks and things like that. Uh, we, the first two or three here, I, I really like, they're, they're, they've been really successful and survival all the way through the season uh, really, really has impressed me. Warm season three, uh, probably a little less than the first two, but still successful in my in my opinion. Uh, if we if we look at you know at the the costs here, we're somewhere we're we're up there a little ways, uh, and I'll, I'll make some comments after I get done showing all these. All right, Penn State Penn State mix. A lot of the um, research and stuff that Penn State has done over the years, and they were they were probably one of the first universities that that did a lot of of uh, research and things like that with with cover crops. This this mix, the red clover, hairy vetch, and annual ryegrass, was one of the most uh, successful that they had back east. Now. The difference, the difference between the corn crops that we raise here versus the corn crops they raise in Pennsylvania is where we have probably higher populations, our hybrids are taller with irrigation, we have a more dense canopy and things like that. So, so what I did ever since I started this, I thought I'm gonna take their most successful mix and enter it every year into the plot. Now. Again, if you look at it, fairly, fairly, it's pretty, it's pretty reasonable as far as the stand and stuff like that, their survivability and stuff like that. But one, one thing I think that I've noticed out of this is the hairy vetch. Eh, I haven't seen a lot of that in 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 the years that we've done that. But but what I'm beginning to analyze, or think here is. Cereal rye has been very, very popular in central Nebraska. We know that. And, and for most pay, most situations, it works great. In a interseeding project, I'm leaning more towards using annual rye grass over cereal rye. And the reason is it's, it's more shade tolerant than, than rye. Okay, number five. All right, this is just the mix that the cooperator and I and myself threw together. 
we run it through Green Cover's uh, smart calculator, and this is the this is the mix that that we that we come up with. But forty one dollars an acre. Now I I'm pretty sure that in most cases nobody is going to want to spend forty one dollars an acre on, on, on cover crop. But if you look at this, this is not, this isn't as successful as some of the, the ones that I showed, like one, two, and three, uh, as far as crop, you know, emergence, density of the cover crop and stuff like that. So at forty-one dollars, we thought, okay, so what if we minim, what if we uh, just reduce those rates of each one of those. So, so this next, this next one, we basically just reduced everything. We got that, we got that down to $14 and 75 cents an acre. I don't know if you, if you compare, if you compare this one versus the one where we didn't reduce it, really not, not a lot of difference as far as emergence and what you're seeing there and we say you know quite a few dollars per acre i'm not saying that this is uh what i would recommend but if anything 14 i'd rather spend 14 dollars and 75 cents an acre than 41 dollars all right a little a little a little background uh, the family that i've been working with um, over the years has has I'm gonna go up, has done has done this mix. Elbon rye at six pounds per acre, four pounds of red clover, less than ten dollars an acre. Okay, what, what I'm seeing here is pretty good emergence early on when the sunlight and stuff, but it kind of it just basically dissipates as the as the season goes on, so so in our in our conversations, we thought, well, what if we what if we throw in what if we throw in ten pounds of annual rye or three pounds of annual rye grass? A little bit of an improvement as far as what we're seeing there on the the seventh of uh, would that be October? So. It added it added about three dollars and eighty cents an acre, but we we still still really aren't all that happy with this. Okay. Now, all right. Let me let me let me summarize what I've just went over. First of all, my my goal here. Is especially on the interseeding uh, plots and everything. I would like to eventually get to a point where I can say, "All right, Joe, you plant this, this, and this, or whatever that mix may be, and majority of the time that's going to be successful, and that's going to be." economical and that's that's one of my goals here i want to narrow this down where we can get the best uh the best uh results from from the dollars that you spend so that is one goal that that i have with the plot the, we're, we're going to go ahead and continue this uh as basically as long as we think we need to uh, I know we've had I've had a lot of questions about well what about what about clovers and things like that. Uh, we're we're toying with the idea in 2021 of maybe having an entry there where we just plant clover as a mono species. That that's that's we'll probably do that, but I can I can definitely make a couple couple questions or you know results here that I feel pretty pretty sure of first of all I don't know if cereal rye is the way to go in interseeding I've seen 
much better luck with, with annual ryegrass. Uh, and another thing that we that is definitely important is you need to, you need to get this interseeding done somewhere around B4. Now, can you just jump into this? Well, you got to realize that when you're interseeding into growing corn, it's not just about planting your covers in that in that that time period, but herbicide herbicide plans things like that you have to, you have to think about and and do all of those types of decisions to be able to accomplish this and i think with that uh crystal i'm done i don't know if we can take any questions if not uh, if anybody has any ideas i i have my cell phone number there on this last slide um, they're more than welcome to, to call me and, and ask me some questions. So, and we're, we here at Central Platte, we're gonna go ahead and, and put this slide, this, this slide presentation up on our website uh, and you can get on and, and review what I went over here today at the meeting. With that, I'm done. <laughs>